the family of God. Now there's victory in Jesus. Let's sing about it. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. On the last verse, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Now, do you have joy in your heart and glad you're in the house of the Lord? Say amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Chase. Good morning. The uh, the left side's full over there today. When you were you're just talking. It's full. It looks nice over there. So, right side, Je Jeff, get them rounded up. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I, it's, it is nice to see everybody in here today. Uh, if you would, please sign the attendance sheet. There's one in front of you there. Uh, if you'll fill that out, and Steve will pick that up later. Um, we also had a full Sunday school class this morning. Pastor Phil was talking about inviting somebody else, and if they do, they're sitting on the floor. So we'll have to bring some pillows next week. Um, women's Bible study coming up, and then get with uh, Susan Henry on that. And then also the Women of Joy Conference, get with Robin on that. Um, Have to know today. Okay. If you want to go, let Susan know today. Um, and I did make an announcement last week uh, about Paco and his family coming today, and I want to welcome them today. So if everybody give them a hand for coming out today. Thank you, guys. Uh, with that, oh, I have one more, sorry. Um, prayer concern. I know there's, there's several at the bottom there, but Sue came up and uh, mentioned that we need to keep her mom in prayer she will be 95 this spring, and uh, she's, she's had a few complications, so if you guys would keep her in your prayers. Uh, I think Cal has a microphone. Um, as you see, the walls are bare, but i um, just uh, glad to get back to uh, a new year. And those decorations that came down, if you didn't pick those up last week, they're over in the fellowship hall. So if you'll take care of those for me, and then what's left I will pack away, but uh, we appreciate it if you would, would take those uh, greens with you. And also I'm asking for a prayer for my mom. Um, Wednesday she goes to see about a hip and a knee or whatever is going on with her, and uh, she doesn't like to be slowed down, and that is slowing her down. So if you just lift her up, I'd appreciate it. Laura Jean. 
Jimmy had just mentioned um, Mildred Motley. They're taking her to the doctor as well. He didn't know any details, but taking her as well. I did forget one. I see uh, Ms. Terrell nodding her head at me here. We are feeding the Compassion Clinic. If you haven't talked to her already or a mission team member, please get with them. That's tomorrow at uh, 5, 530. So if you haven't got with them, please get with them and uh, deliver a meal. So anybody else? The kids are Just, ready. I think there's already a slide, but youth does start back up this Wednesday. So if anybody wants to come out, remember there's always a need. You can serve food. You can help control you know, the activity in the rooms. There, If you don't want to lead a, a lesson, there is plenty of things that, that you can help us with. So we would love to have you. Um, so, what is it, 5.30? Yep. 5.30, Wednesday. Yep. Jane and I have talked and I have discussed with Philip and he says, I have the authority to decide about third Sunday dinner will be next Sunday. We'll continue with them. All right, very good. Oper from uh, Hinton down there. A good friend of mine had a bad wreck last week, so he sure needs all the prayers. He's in the OU trauma center in Oklahoma City. Nobody else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just reach out to you today, Lord, for the uh, spoken prayers and also the unspoken prayers, Lord. We know uh, you have a plan in everything we do, Lord, and we thank you for, for giving us a path to follow, Lord, your perfect example. Lord, help us to go out and spread your love and your light to others that need it, Lord. And as we join our voices together in the prayer you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our praise hymns, the little chorus, praise the name of Jesus. We'll sing it through twice as our little ones can go ahead and head off to Children's Church. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. One more time. Praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock, he's my fortress, he's my deliverer, and him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Offering meditation. I was. I, I thought about this for well since before the holidays, right? Does everybody have that one person that they just don't know how to gift them? They don't know what to get for them. Uh, so I was thinking about this this week: is as how do we know what gift to give our Lord and Savior? Um, and we're not the only ones to think this. And as, as I was reading scripture and all this, I come across Psalms one sixteen twelve. A psalmist asked the question that each of us feel at times. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? And when we stop to ponder how we can respond to God's continuous blessings, to us we surely wonder, what can I do to show my gratitude to God? Even David responded in his own question by stating, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord I will pay my vows to the Lord, now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, and in the midst of you. The, Lord's, the Lord does not need our offerings. We cannot enrich him by our gifts. 
that God permits us to show our appreciation for his mercy by self-sacrificing efforts to extend the same to others. This is the only way in which it is possible for us to manifest our gratitude and love to God. He has provided no other. Our offerings are a response to God's giving to us. They are an implementation of our participation with God, working from God's abundance rather than our scarcity. As we recall God's benefits towards us, let's be faithful in showing him our thankfulness and gratitude by supporting his work with our tithes and offerings. So I got to look, and, and the tithes, tithes and offerings, of course, we all have heard scripture about the 10%, but it don't have to stop there. And offering goes all the way back to uh, Exodus. And I read this, uh, Exodus 35, verse 4, it says, This is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Uh, and then it goes on further to say, All who are skilled among you are to come and make everything the Lord has commanded. Uh, this was back when they was building the tabernacle, and he needed their skill sets to perform all duties. Uh, it's pleasant enough he didn't need their finances. So it, it got me pondering. God wants a little bit of what you cherish. Uh, the thing that you're reluctant to give the most is what he wants a little bit of, okay? Uh, without your reluctance. If you can give it to him without reluctance, that's how he's testing what you have in your heart. And it was kind of funny, it was in class today, and I got on here, what will you bring to honor God? And in class today, I wrote down this as a remark, Pedro. Right, Philip? Uh, so, again, what will you bring to honor God in your house and in your life? Let's sing about how much we adore him as we give this morning. <clears throat> sing Father Acapella together one more time. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Please stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being such an, a, a God of abundance, and, and thank you for sharing that with us in our lives here, and we just lift up these offerings to give back to you for the sacrifices you've made for us in our lives. We ask that you walk with us in our daily walks, Lord, continue to use us to bless others as you see fit, and give honor and bring honor to you in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. into the new year, how many of you blown your resolution so far? <laughs> Each year it seems to take us less time to come to the realization that our resolutions, resolutions don't last long. 
It takes more than resolve to make a new start in life. Resolve is a good and necessary thing if only we can follow through on it. What is the solution to broken resolutions? Having the right resource that will enable you to succeed where before you failed. At this table, we remember that it is Christ, not the turning of the page of a calendar, that makes a new beginning possible. It is not beginning a new year, but being in Christ that makes the difference. In remembrance of me, eat this bread. In remembrance of me, drink this wine. In remembrance of me, pray for the time when God's own. In remembrance of me, feed the poor. In remembrance of me, open the door and let your brother in. Let him. Search for truth in remembrance of me, always love in remembrance of me. Thank you for this day, and thank you for you being you and letting us uh, freely come here today to pray, to worship your Lord, to study your word, Lord, to start a new resolution in our lives, Lord, that will last because you are the backbone of it. We ask you to bless these women for the nourishment of our bodies and ask you to be with those on the prayer list and those that are hurting, Lord, that you just know each and every one there, Lord. As always, go with us throughout the week as we meet people that will see you through us in our actions. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Mark chapter 1. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, I was raised in Oklahoma, so I just do things kind of poorly sometimes. Uh, if I'd ever been raised in Texas or Kansas, it would probably been better. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 28. We're going to be looking at the preaching of Jesus, the call of Jesus, and the conflict surrounding Jesus. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me. Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, note, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. <clears throat> the evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. I want to talk to you about the preaching of Jesus, the call of Jesus, and the conflict surrounding Jesus from this passage of Scripture. First of all, the preaching of Jesus. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. The gospel was the message that Jesus preached. The word gospel means what? It means good news. And Jesus, the message of Jesus is good news. There used to be a song that said, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to you. And that's true. What would your life be without Jesus? Jesus is marvelous because of what he does to a person when they accept him as their Savior. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, you're missing out on life. You need Jesus. Jesus is good news. And Jesus came preaching the gospel, the good news of God. Notice it is the good news of God because the gospel originated with God. The subject of the gospel is Jesus, and so it's the good news of God. It's also the good news of Jesus. Jesus says three things about the gospel. He says, the time has come. The time has come. That is right now. This is not time as you would measure on the clock at 3.30 or 11.10 or something like that. It is more time like, like a pregnant woman when the water breaks. The time has come. It's here. We've been looking forward to it, but this is that particular moment when the gospel the good news of God has come to planet Earth. It's as if you had a bottle 
and you've been pouring water in the bottle, and you pour and you pour, and the level in the bottle rises and rises and rises until finally that last drop comes and the bottle is completely full. All of earth has been looking forward to this particular moment. And now it is here. And Jesus stands before the people preaching. The time is near. The old age is ending. The Old Testament is ending. Worshiping God by killing animals is ending. Looking forward to the coming of the Messiah is ending because he is now here. The time has arrived. This is the beginning of something brand new that's never happened in the earth before. The gospel of God has come. It's here. Right now, it is exploding in your midst. That's what Jesus was preaching. The age of good news. Hope is here. Freedom is here. Release from bondage is here. Acceptance for those who have been without value is here. Ransom is here. Rescue is, oh, I love that word, rescue. You've been enslaved by Satan. You've been a captive. You've been lost, and now you have been rescued. The time of rescue has come. Healing for those who are sick is here. The time has come. Jesus preached this message that he is the beginning of something radically new that has never happened before. The second thing that Jesus <clears throat> preached is the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is among you. And this is one of the most important concepts in the entire New Testament. And... Uh, I wish God would give me the ability to preach it in such a way that the excitement that you should feel would be exploded in your heart as you think about the kingdom of God. One of the most important concepts in all the Bible is the kingdom of It is the rule of God in the heart of believers. And through the rule of God in the hearts of the believers, the rule of God spreads out into all of the world. And so the world itself is changed because those who believe in Jesus Christ are themselves changed. And we are a part of the kingdom of God. Now Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven. In the epistle, it's called the church, the church of God, or the church of the living God, or the family of God. Spiritually, it's the temple of God. Figuratively, it's the sheep of God. It's the army of God. It's the people who have been joined to God and are living for God, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near. You became a part of the physical kingdom of the United States of America when you were born in this country, except for those that were born in another country. <laughs> You became a part of that country when you were born there. When you were born again in the kingdom of God, you became a citizen of this kingdom. You must be born again. That's the way you get into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has a king. All hail, do you all sing that song? All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star, and throughout eternity I'll sing your praises. Jesus is the king. We are the subjects of the king. A kingdom has a territory, and it is the heart of all people. The kingdom of God does not have a geographical context. It doesn't go from a certain 
line to a certain line is not bounded by oceans. It is every heart that has accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord. You are in the kingdom of God. You were born into the kingdom of God. There are two things that are necessary to get into this kingdom. Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. Jesus, Jesus preaching is incredible. I believe that Jesus was the best preacher that has ever walked on planet Earth. I think it would have been incredible to listen to the preaching of Jesus. The second best preacher, I think, was probably John the Baptist. Oh, John the Baptist was, was incredible. But Jesus came preaching. He came preaching the, the good news of God. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, this sounds like two things. Repent, one. Randy, hold up your two fingers. Believe. Everybody do this. Repent. And two. Believe. Repent. Believe. Sounds like two things, doesn't it? Repent. And believe. But, in a sense, they are one thing. Because to believe the good news is to believe in Jesus and to go this way. And when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have left what is behind you back over here. And so you repent, which means you turn away from all of this and you turn to all of this. If you turn away from left, you go right. If you turn away from south, you go north. If you turn away from east, you go west. If you turn away from sin, you go to Jesus Christ. And you believe in Jesus Christ. There is no belief in Jesus Christ without repentance. You can't believe in Jesus and keep on loving sin. You can't believe in Je you can't say that you believe in Jesus and keep on living the way you've always lived. Jesus changes you. He's the greatest change, change agent on planet Earth. And so repent, turn away from the old way, and believe in Jesus Christ, follow the new way. Brand new things are happening. The old is ending and the new is beginning. The gospel of God is here. Repent, turn away from the old, and believe the new. Believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus preached repentance and faith. And any faith that doesn't include repentance is a fakey fault. And by the way, both of these are present tense. When do you quit repenting? You never quit repenting. Unless you're perfect. <laughs> and probably you're not. Everybody but Paco's perfect. Or everybody but Paco's imperfect. Uh, you know, no. <laughs> no. Randy, I've heard you talk uh, how difficult it is sometimes to live, live for Jesus. You know, the devil makes it difficult for us. And so we continually repent. We continually repent because we could have always done better. So we are continually living in a state of repentance and we are continually living in a state of faith. Never quit repenting and never quit believing. They both continue... Martin Luther said the old Adam in us by daily contrition and repentance should be drowned and should be drowned and die with all sin and evil life. Now I want to talk to you about faith. Repent and believe. There are three components of faith, and this is important. Number one is acknowledgement. We acknowledge the truth. Jesus, everything you said is true. You believe that? Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Everything that Jesus said is true. Just this last week, I was asked, do you do marriage counseling? And I responded, I do biblical counseling. 
And the Bible speaks a great deal about marriage. (laughs) But I believe that marriage is supposed to follow the truth of God. There is no other way for marriage to be a good marriage without following the truth of God. That's the only way. That's the only way. Truth. Faith, first of all, says, Jesus, I believe that your way is best. Your way is right. Your way is the truth, and it is the only truth. The second part of faith is attachment. You receive the truth, and then you become a part of the truth, and it becomes a part of you, and you start living the truth. You start acting the truth. You not only believe, you you become a believer. You become a believer, and you start living the truth. And then faith is confident. The certainty that you are on the right path. Complete reliance on what Jesus said, resulting in a sure hope. This last week, Sherry told me about a devotion that uh, she has been reading, and I think this uh, illustrates this. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. There was the tree of life, which represents God and truth. And then there is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is man finding his own truth that is different than God's truth. And when we start taking of the tree of the knowledge of evil, we lose access to the tree of life. In your life, you are either following the truth of God or you're following your own truth. You're doing it either your way Or you're doing it God's way. You are making up your decision as to what you think is the best way to respond in your particular situation. Or you are going into the Word of God and through prayer you are seeking what God says is the way you ought to respond in your particular situation. And those two are not often the same. So we pray, not my will, but thine be done. We don't take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil picking out which way we want to go, we take of the tree of life, which is God's way. For faith is acknowledgement of the truth, attachment to the truth, and confidence in the truth. This is the preaching that Jesus preached. Number two, I want to talk to you this morning about the call of Jesus. As Jesus was going on By the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. And then he went going on a little farther, he saw James and John mending their nets. And Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. When the gospel is preached, Through that gospel, Jesus places a call on people's lives. Have you been called? Have you heard the call? You see, when you study the gospel of Mark, everything that Mark says about Jesus is something we can do. Remember, it's a very active gospel. Jesus was baptized, so we can be baptized. Jesus preached, so we can repent and believe the gospel. And here Jesus calls people to be his disciples, and so we can hear the call and follow him. Have you heard the call? I can't help but remember when I responded to the call. I was about eight or nine years old in a church called Christ Church at County Line down in the Kainicki Mountains of southeastern Oklahoma. My dad happened to be the preacher. And on that particular Sunday, 
I felt the call of God in my heart. And I remember walking down the aisle, putting my hand in the hand of my father and making the good confession. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And I accept him as my Savior and as the Lord of my life. After church was dismissed that Sunday morning, we went one mile north to Des Umphrey's fish pond. And Dad baptized me. A visible public testimony of the decision that I had made about an hour before in church, accepting Jesus as my Savior and as my Lord. See, Jesus doesn't just call Peter and Andrew, James and John. Jesus is calling you and you and you and you and you. He calls each one of us individually. He calls us. And we have to listen to the call. And when you hear the call and when you answer it, it elevates you. It, ele it makes you a better person. It makes you fit for eternity. Leonard, when you're living for Jesus, you're getting better and better and better. And if that process of getting better continues on for eternity, think how good you're going to be. You're going to be with God in heaven forever. But if you turn Jesus down, you're not going to get better and better and better. You're going to get worse and worse and worse. And if you keep on getting worse and worse and worse for eternity, how bad are you going to be, Leonard? Have you heard the call? Have you, have you answered the call? Because Jesus wants you not just to attend church. He wants you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a learner, one who listens, one who believes, one who follows, and then one who imitates the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're becoming more and more and more like Jesus. See, I have a whole bunch of people in front of me this morning, all of which are hopefully becoming a little bit like Jesus Christ every day of your life. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the good news. So the call of Jesus is not just to Peter and Andrew, James and John, but it is to Joe and Harry and Dick and Mary and Steve and Jane and Tina, and Sherry, and Philip, and whoever it might be. By the way, when is the best time to answer the call? It says, at once they left their nets and followed him. And then uh, the same is true for James and John. There may never be another moment in your life when it is as easy for you to do the right thing as it is right now. This may be that moment when it is the easiest for you to say yes to Jesus Christ. You, can't be, you cannot promise, you cannot be guaranteed that it's going to be easier next week or next month or next year. Paul said it this way, today is God's day of salvation. And today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The call of God. Jesus calls us and we answer at once. Or we don't answer at all. Will you hear the call of God on your life and on your heart? today. We talked about the preaching of Jesus. We talked about the call of Jesus. Let me just real 
quickly talk to you about the conflict that surrounds Jesus, and then I'll let you go home. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue. Where did he go to the synagogue? Where did he go to teach? Into the synagogue. He went into the church, and the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority and not as teachers of the law. Just then, immediately, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, what do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Boy, that was a noisy church service. Jesus was preaching and the devils were screaming out in a loud voice and then Jesus was telling them in a stern voice to shut up. How would you like to be in that church service? Man, you would never forget that church service. You would never forget that church service. By the way, every time Jesus met a demon, he exercised it. He threw it out. He kicked it out. He is the Lord of all. He's the Lord of the devil. But what is unusual about this passage of scripture is that this demon-possessed man was in the church. Hello? Do you think the devil ever goes to church? He did here. Do you think the church is where God meets? And, and I guess that's true, but Satan is the adversary. Satan is the one that is bringing conflict, and Satan was in church too. And as I start looking over the church this morning, and I can tell which ones of you are ones, and... <laughs> And I can start pointing fingers and calling names, you know. In their synagogue was one who was possessed by an evil spirit in the very house of God. And this demon says, what do you want to do with us? Note the plural. With us. I don't think this means that there were multiple demons in the person. I believe that it means that this demon had taken over this one individual's life so that the demon and the individual had become an entity. And the us was the man possessed by the evil spirit. That was the us. And Jesus was separating the evil spirit from the man. Man, I could preach a whole sermon on this and call it the day the devil went to church. I think sometimes the devil does some of his greatest work in church. You think he does the greatest his work out in the bar or the tavern or the brothel. I think Satan doesn't have to worry about those people too much. He's already got them. But right here is where the conflict is raging. It's where people are making decisions for heaven or hell and where they're going to spend eternity. And Satan is right here trying to get people to move in his direction. And Jesus is right here trying to get people to move in his direction. And sometimes you can feel the tension in church between the light and the darkness. And that's what was happening here. Why would the devil go to church? I want to give you four or five reasons. That's on the back of your little piece of paper, I think. Number one is because the devil's always been religious. By the way, religion doesn't mean you're Christian. The devil's very religious. He just doesn't acknowledge Jesus as Savior. You know, if religious people were in church, Satan would be on the front row because he's one of the most religious people there is. By the way, religion won't save you. It's Jesus that saves you. Uh, the devil believes in God probably more than you do. And he trembles. You believe there is one God good? Even the demons believe that and shudder. The devil is pretty good at Christian theology. He believes in one God. A.W. Tozer said the devil is a better theologian than any of us and is a devil still. <laughs> Number two, the devil goes to church to keep you from worshiping Jesus. Jesus is God. 
And Jesus wants you to worship him. But the devil will do anything he can to keep you from worshiping Jesus. And if you come to church where the worship of Jesus is going on, the devil will be at work trying to get you to stop worshiping Jesus. Oh, he has a lot of tools. The text messages on your cell phone in church will keep you from worshiping Jesus. Won't go any farther there. Won't go any farther there. <laughs> yeah. Distractions. I have noticed that a lot of times when, when the tension for God and against Satan gets real thick in church, somebody will have a coughing attack. I don't think that's an accident. I think we wrestle against flesh. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. And Satan is at work trying to distract you from worshiping Jesus. And he doesn't have to do that work in the outside world. He does that work in church. The devil loves to go to church because he's afraid of Christianity. But he loves church Christianity. You know, sometimes you go to church and you think you're doing the right thing because you're just in the right spot. No, it's what are you doing in that spot? It's kind of like, you know, going to the garage doesn't make you a car. And going to church doesn't make you a Christian. But Christians do go to church because we are to join together to worship God. The devil goes to church because he doesn't want you to worship God. The devil goes to church because he's looking for prey. P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y. The devil's looking for people that he can dominate, that he can control, that he can influence. That's why this demon had taken over this person because Satan had found him and Satan had taken over him. Satan's ultimate goal is to control you. Remember Simon Peter? One time Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired, has asked for you to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. Peter said, Satan is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour us. You know when a lion roars? A lion roars as he's pouncing. When the prey is close into his hand. And I think Satan does a lot of his roaring and his pouncing in church. Satan goes to church because he wants to be worshipped. Because he wants to be worshipped. And he wants you to give him your worship. But this man went to church filled with an evil spirit met Jesus. The demon got kicked out of him and he left a free man because he'd met Jesus in church. You see the conflict? Darkness and light. Satan and Jesus. That which is false and that which is true. And we're right in the middle of it at Dover Christian Church. Paco, that's why we need you. There's about 50 or 60 kids out there that you can influence for Jesus Christ. They are the prey of Satan. And our job is to rescue them through Christ and then bring them into the light of salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, we've talked about the preaching of Jesus. We've talked about the call of Jesus. We've talked about the tension that surrounds Jesus. Isn't Jesus marvelous? Jesus is the best thing. 
that can ever happen to you. Let's pray. Father, I pray for Dover Christian Church. I pray that we would fall in love with your word. We would fall in love with the Jesus that we find, that we encounter in the word of God. Father, we don't want to be prey to Satan. We want to be find freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to listen to the gospel. We want to hear the call and become a disciple. We want to escape Satan and live for Jesus and live for God. Father, if there's anybody that needs to be saved this morning, I pray that they would come down the aisle and acknowledge that they need Jesus as their Savior. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted. Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thine atonement didst give Thyself for me. I owe no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne, my life I give it's forth to live, O Christ, for Thee alone. Let's sing one more verse. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call. Follow his leading and give him my all. O oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee. For thou in thine atonement didst give thyself for me. I owe no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give its forth to live. O Christ, for thee alone. I don't think it was an accident that those kids come to that door, coming back into the sanctuary. It's a reminder for every single one of us, just like Philip was talking about Paco and these young people that we have a responsibility to. Let's pray for our parents of these young ones and these little ones as they come back in here because we as a church have a responsibility to lead them to live a, Christ, live a life for Christ. Let's pray together. Thanks for being here.